Sleepless, Chapter 1, May 8th, 4 p.m. Flies circle angrily. The smell of rotting meat runs thick in the air. A broken window casts burning sunlight on an aged face. Eyes are swollen shut, mouth sits open, giving flies a place to nest. A photographer walks around the tiny shack with camera in hand, taking pictures of the humbled house. Constable Joe Kogatana slides open the door, stepping in. He is a towering figure. His hair is short and speckled black and white. His eyes are cold and hard. He dresses in an old suit, gray with a hint of blue. Joe takes off his gloves as he approaches the dead body on the floor. Joe kneels to wipe the sweat from his eyes. Today is the fourth day in a row that the temperature has failed to drop below 100 degrees. The photographer kneels next to Joe. So, who is the piece of beef jerky? Joe slaps the photographer with one gloved hand, then points at him with a disapproving gaze. Boy, he protests, you are from the city, so maybe you don't know the way people in Chinsamaru talk. But around here, we don't speak ill of the dead. Joe stands up. He walks around the room looking at the decor laying about. His name is Nobani. Joe takes a labored breath. That is four people this month. Damned heat. The photographer looks to Joe. So, you think he died of... Joe doesn't let him finish his thought. I will let Dr. Sue make that call. He digs around in his pockets, pulling out his phone. But I don't see anything here that would make me say otherwise. He shoots a gaze back to the photographer. Let's step outside. It is hot out. Maybe hotter than it has ever been. Flies plague the village. The river runs high in spite of the heat. It has been raining heavy almost every night. The town is divided by the river. On the east bank is the school, hospital, and most of the residential housing. Upon the hillside marking the gates that leads out to Shika Woods is a, sh is a Shinto temple. On the west end of the river is where the lumber mill once stood, but in recent years it has fallen into disrepair. Now the west end is mostly farmland. Chintamaro is a geographically isolated pay place. Mountains and rivers for miles. Forests have turned the village into a world all its own. Sleepless, Chapter 1, May 8th, 6.45 p.m. Sadkura Nekoba is the chaplain of the Shinto Temple. He is charged with the public face of the church, organizing rituals and services, offering tours of the sacred Shika forest, and of the temple. But on top of all that, protecting the holy grounds and the monks. That is his duty. After all, somebody needs to take care of the business end of things. Most monks have taken vows that prevent them from interacting with the public. Nekoba, on the other hand, is not a monk. He is an employee of the church. A parade of candles and incense are set up around the chapel. Nekoba and Kogatana work to dress a body, a giant of a man, elderly and badly burned. This was meant to be a wake, but no one in town knows this stranger. He had outlived his friends and his family. For the last year of his life, Kogatana was the only person he had spoken with. The door to the temple is pushed open by a child walking in. A girl, not yet thirteen, dressed in a fluffy flowery dress, vest and a wide-brimmed cap that looks like it belongs to a madame in a Victorian-era painting. From one arm dangles a book bag, as both hands are dedicated to closing the umbrella she holds. Negba calls over. Welcome. If you're here to pay your respects to Mr. Sirosanto, please sign in at the book at the podium. 
The child walks over to the book and writes her name down. Eve Mazumo. Eve walks over to the altar and looks down the body. She folds her hands and lowers her eyes in a moment of prayer. Kokotana speaks up. Are you acquainted with Sir Santo? Mazumo shakes her head. Not so much. I'm not acquainted with anybody, but I have been reading over some of the old headlines. We've had a lot of wealthy and successful people pass through here, including Emperor Nagano. Sir Santo had been a horse breeder in his youth. The paper boasts that the people came from all over the island to see his horses. She looks up to Kogatana. You are Constable Joe Kokotana. Your sister Shoujo is a real estate princess living in Hong Kong. The constable straightens his stance. It seems you know something of my family. There are a lot of families with interesting past. Also Hanzo. His father was a spy working in the imperial house. Shazuki Tenzuma's great-grandmother was a herbalist. To the Tenzuma, healing runs in their blood. Then there's Takeshi Su. He's the only person in his family's 200-year history to leave the village. Then there's Rico. He and the other Jets say they have kept the forge burning for 20 generations. Joe cuts Eve off. I'm sorry. I think I missed your name. Can you repeat it, please? Eve Mazumo, Eve explains. Joe lowers his head, thinking. I don't think I've had any dealings with the Mazmo family in some time. He looks to the girl. Where has your family been as of late? Eve explains. We are living in Sheikah Woods. We are woodsmen doing what we have been doing forever. Making and selling magic charms. Nekwa, after finishing dressing the body, steps around the other side of the altar. Well, as long as you're here, young lady. Perhaps you would like to help the constable and I. Eve looks to the monk. How can I help? The monk picks up a basket of flowers. He hands it off to the girl. The constable and I are going to pick up that raft there. He points to the table that the body is tied to. We are going to walk it to the front door, then across the bridge and down the steps to the riverbed. Walk in front of us. Sprinkle flowers on the road. The ritual is an old one. In modern days, the funeral rite is all but forgotten. With more than half of the families living on the island having adopted new religions, very few still remember when or why this custom had began. After death, the body is dressed in a cotton gown, bleached white. The skin is rubbed down with baking powder then painted white. The dead are tied to a raft, then lowered into the river behind the temple to be washed out to sea. Four candles are set on the raft to see off the dead as the raft starts its trip downstream. Eve looks to Joe. Did you know him? Joe offers a soft reply. I may have been the last person that did. He takes a deep breath. It is sad to watch the past get dragged down the river. Eve rests a hand on Joe's back. Would it be less sad to see the young pass? Nagaba is the one to reply. Young, old. Loss is loss, irrespective. Mazumo looks up to Nagaba. Do you believe death is forever? Nagaba shuts his eyes and drops his head, thinking, I don't know. Some of the monks think death is a door to another world. Others think it is like sleep, and you'll wake up in a new body. Mazumo runs up the path. She stands on the bridge. She raises a hand over her head and waves to the raft as it reaches the mouth to the ocean. She shouts out, Goodbye, Sierra Santo-san. Have a good trip. We'll see you next time. The rat vanishes out to sea. The setting sun pulls from this world, it seems. Eve still smiling and waving as she watches the sunset. 
The hot wind whispers, her skirt flutters. The aging constable and the young monk join her in watching the skyline. Sleepless, Chapter 1, May 8th, 10.15 p.m. Well after dark, half dozen kids have made their way into the woods. Rigi Tinsma walks with his younger sister, Lita Tinsma. At the meeting spot, already waiting, are Sakura Tomoji, Rei Hanzo, Jin Kokotana, and Odette Su. As Rigi approaches, Jin sets down the fire poker he was using to stir up the campfire and walks over to Rigi, offering him a hug. Jin looks at Lita. Well, it looks like we have a new cutie. Sakura is digging around in the cooler looking for something to cook. Good. I was getting bored of trying to look up Odette's skirt. Odette laughs. If you wanted to see my panties, you could just ask. Sakura jokes. That would take all the sport out of the game. Fiji barks. Play nice. Ray sits on a tree stump. Whose turn is it to start off today? Jen walks back over to his seat. Well, now that we're all here, I think it's my turn to go first. Odette pulls one leg into her chest, hugging herself as she leans over slightly. She pushes down her skirt to make sure she is covered. I hope you have something better than Mr. Big Hands this time. Leah looks back and forth as her brother chooses a place for them to sit in the circle. What is going on? Rigi grins. Just a little club. We come out here, eat hot dogs, tell ghost stories. Jin looks around his friends. Does anyone here remember Akadama Azu? The group mumbles and murmurs in large. Odette is the only one whose voice is heard. Isn't that the old woman hunter? Rhi leans over to whisper with Odette. I think that was Usagiaki. Jin starts to tell a story. Moji. He used to go to our school. Spent his nights hanging out at the beach house, just like we do sometimes. He was even friends with Mr. Tomoji. Sakura cuts in. I don't remember anyone named Moji at our school. Jin continues. Back in September, we had some great storms, cold winds. Well, it was a good time if you're a surfer. Moji liked to surf. He hit the waves at sunset. Then he spent some time laying in the sands. After that, it was a time... It was... God fucking son of a bitch. After that, it was time to take the showers and go home. Moji tied up his surfboard and went to the shower room. He washed himself off in the public shower. He's alone. It is dark. He then steps into the stalls and locks the door. Odette cuts in. I didn't know they had stalls on the boys' side. Rigi looks to Odette. Why wouldn't we? Odette turns to Rigi. I thought you had that foot wash thing, and all stood to do shoulder to shoulders things. Ray shakes his head. Boys can't shit standing up. Odette nods in understanding. Ah! Lita looks to her brother. Foot wash? Jane goes on. Moji sits down and he does his thing. He then reaches over to grab some TP and freezes. He looks over and the paper towel dispenser is gone! The bathroom door opens as a new man walks in, tall and pale. Moji sits, his pants around his knees, not sure what to do. The new man whispers, Red? Woo! He repeats, Red! Woo! Moji watches as the shadow of the man stands outside the stall. The tail man calls into the bathroom. Red? Blue! Moji whispers. Hand reaches over the top of the stall, holding on to the door. Red? Blue! The voice calls in again. Moji pushes his hands to the walls, backing away 
as far as he can from the door. Moji whispers, Blue. Jin jumps to his feet, shouting. And with that, the door breaks open, revealing a bloated, white-skinned beast. The monster picks up Moji in both of its giant hands, flips him upside down, and shoves him into the toilet, drowning him in brown water. An unfamiliar voice speaks out. An onryo that hangs out in bathrooms? I've never seen an onryo in a bathroom. Everyone spins to face the new voice. A child is sitting amongst them, all of a sudden, an umbrella laid across her lap, and her legs folded at the knee. Bree speaks up, hey, another girl. Eva kicks her feet back and forth, thinking, but I think I could see how such a monster would come to be. I remember a story about a man from the second Victorian era, a Dr. Jonathan Snow. A man that ran across all of the Western world chasing a monster that drinks the water from men's skin. All the men around Snow feared toxic gases called miasma, but Snow thought the monster was a bug called dysentery, I think, or maybe it was cholera or E. coli, I can't remember. But a doctor chasing a bug that makes people pee themselves to death? That would make an interesting ghost story. Marie speaks up. I think your time is up, Jin. It is my turn to tell a story. Jin takes a bow, waving his friend on. You have the floor. Marie starts. All of you know the story of our town, right? You all know how Nobunaga came to visit our town generations ago. Nobunaga had a regiment of ghost hunters that followed him around. Nobunaga was hunted by monsters all of his life. One day, he encountered a fox named Tomono no Miya. The fox which tried to drink the soul of him as he slept. The mighty Nagano knew at once the threat he had encountered. He covered his temple in magical scrolls to frighten the fox and force her to take her true shape. He chased the fox. A thousand samurais chased the monster from the capital all the way to here. Tomono no Miya is the child of a Matarasu Okami, the most powerful of the Elder Gods. Okami would not let her beloved die in battle, so she came to earth in the shape of a white dog. Okami set up a game. The fox and the emperor must do battle here in our township. But Nobunaga is no fool. He knows that the fox will cheat, no matter the nature of the game. So, he has his wizards gather around him and cast a spell on the village. One hundred families choose a sacrifice. One hundred men must stay in this town forever. Nubunaga must do something to keep the fox distracted. Keep her attention on him and not on his wizards. Nobunaga tells the fox to sit, and he too will sit. The fox and the emperor lock eyes. The game ends when one of them can no longer sit. Tomono hates sitting still. But she hates losing even more. So the fox sits, as does Nobunaga. They lie and they watch each other for 36 hours before Nobunaga faints. The wizards and the wise men pick up the emperor and pull him away from the fox before she can attack the holy king. Tomono jumps to her feet and she runs to the wizards. The demon fox shows her fangs, but then a wall of fire erupts from the ground. A cage had been erected, a cage of 100 doors, each door sealed with a soul ward. So long as the children of those that died to seal the door remain in the village, the doors remain locked. 
To this day, Tomino sleeps at the center of the monument of a hundred seals. Oh, that explains. I've seen the monument. It is a thing of beauty. The statue of Tomino no Mia is amazing. Eve adds on. There are lots of spirit cages around Chinsamaru. There are a dozen lining the beach, shaped like Tanuki. There's one outside of Oso's shop that looks like a Nako. Jim points at Odette. Do you have a story today? Odette looks over to VG. Isn't Tenzama next? VG shakes his head. I closed out last week. You can go next. Odette nods. Ten feet tall. She starts as she leans forward, encouraging everyone to get in closer. I was out in the garden behind my house. I saw a woman kneeling in the bushes. I asked her, who are you? She whispered back to me, people call me ten feet tall. Sleepless, Chapter 1, May 8th, 1145 p.m. The kids sit around the fire most of the night. Everyone gain to tell a story if they want. Eve reviewing the last of the stories of the night. As Marzmo tells her tale, the sound of foxes yelping in the trees grows slowly louder. People like to look at the world as if there is good and there is evil. But things are never that easy. There has never been just good and evil. These are ideas that humans concocted to try to make things easier to understand. There are things in the world, strange things, old things, things we can't hope to understand. Forces so great and mighty that the wisdom of men becomes like blood-stained rags. Let me assure you, the forces of the unknown are powerful and unpredictable in ways that are disturbing to mortals. Maybe one of you was friends with Tobawe. He was a kid, not so unlike you all are. He lived in a two-story house. He worked nights at the fishery. One day, he came home from work to find his bedroom window open. He walked to it and looked out, noticing the window adjacent to his was open also. There's a gate between their yards and a walkway on both sides of the fence. He shut the window. The next day he comes around, and when Tobie wakes up, he sees the window is open again. He stands up and shuts the window again. The window to the house across the street is also open. There is no one in the other house. There has been in months. Why is the window open? Day after day, the window is open time and time again. After a week, Tobawe looks down and sees the fence that divides their yards has fallen over. Then a week after that, the walkway was torn up. Toboe asks around. No one knows why. Toboe nails his window shut, but nothing changes. He wakes up in the morning to find his window is open. How strange. He looks across the yard. He can see things in the house across the way he couldn't before. The room across from his is a bedroom, a girl's room. There's a table and a mirror that can be seen just barely in the darkness of the other house. Has somebody moved in? Next, Tobore nails a blanket to the wall to cover his window. But it seems that the universe itself would not allow that to be. The blanket would not stick. No matter how many nails he used, the blanket kept falling off the wall. Tobore awakens in the morning and looks out the window. The house on the other side of the way feels ominous. Tobaway picks up a broom 
and reaches out the window. He can touch the window of the other house with it. The house itself moved four feet closer to him. At least! For days to come, Tobaway refuses to look out the window. He tries to tell the people around him about what he saw, but he can't find the words. The next time he looked out the window, he could touch the window of the other house with a bare hand. It's moved another three feet. The time after that, it is less than two feet between him and the next house, but no one but him can see it. Toboy sits huddled in the corner of his room looking at the window. He can no longer see outside. His window is laid flush with the window of the other house. How can this be? Once the houses were divided by a fence and two walkways, now the houses are his one. A thin layer of glass is all that separates the two of them. What will Toboy discover tomorrow when he awakens? The crowd has fallen silent. The fire blows out as it has found its way to nothing more than dying ashes. Sakura Tomoji takes a deep breath. Something in Eve's voice has her shaking. She laughs to try to calm herself. I want you to come here with us off more often. There's just something about you I like. Sakura stands up. I'll be back. She walks off to the trees, vanishing from sight. The barking of foxes grows louder. Eve looks back and forth. Maybe we should relight the fire? Rain nods and starts to set up the fire pit again. Lady speaks up. Guys, it's midnight. Maybe it's time to call it a day. There's a few moments of murmuring before a begrudging nod finds the crowd. Although the kids each arrived in the forest alone, they walk in a group as they leave. All the kids live within a mile of each other. Jin lives only a block away from the school, making his house the first stop. Then Ri and Sakura. Odette is near the heart of the township, the hospital being the nearest landmark. She ends up walking alone in the end. When Odette finds her way home, her uncle Takeshi Sue is awake. He stands over the kitchen sink, a toothbrush in his mouth. He's a straggly man, long arms and legs, a narrow body, his hair long and undisciplined, a three days growth on his face. He's dressed in a tank top and slacks that are losing their color from days of wash and wear. Takeshi is in his 40s and living like a 20-year-old. He looks like a man that has too much on his mind to keep everything straight. Odette runs up to her uncle. She grabs him behind, squeezing him. Takeshi! She squeals. On your way to work? Takeshi washes his face in the sink, then grabs a box of dried noodles, eating a fistful of them dry. Back from your latest sexual excursion. Odette chuckles. No sex this time, just ghost stories. Takeshi shrugs as he picks up his coat. Well, if things get worse, then let me know. I can take care of things for you. Odette shakes her head. I have no idea what you mean. So, why are you leaving for work at midnight? Takeshi expresses. Another small infestation, it sounds like. I need to start mapping the path of infections. See if we can work out where ground zero is. Odette makes her way to the back room to change into her house coat. How would one know if they had an infection of the intestine? Skin around the lips and areola turn black. Skin around one's joints turns red and inflamed. Cracks and peeling away from the body, fingernails become brittle, eyes grow a film over them. The body stops holding salt, liquids pass through the body without being absorbed into the bloodstream. Your symptoms may vary. Takeshi reads off. Takeshi reads off the possibilities slow and dry. 
Oda comes back in a pink robe. Are you describing an infection or zombification? If you like that, you should read the paper I just saw on the deer rotting flesh syndrome. It may be the most horrifying thing the world has seen in 70 years. It acts like rabies and spreads like influenza. Takeshi looks for his keys. You know, I kind of wish you would cook your food before you eat it. Odette finds his keys for him in the folds of the couch. It's fine. I was eating like this all through my 20s. Takeshi, you're not 20 anymore. You're going to get sick doing stuff like that. After being exposed to a thousand exotic parasites, hundreds of unnamed viruses, every carcinogen known to man, I would be very disappointed if uncooked noodles were what killed me. He tips up his head and calls out. Oh, I also got a call from my sister. Your folks just reached London. Everything went fine. They'll be home in 16-something days. And with that, Takeshi walks outside and unties his bicycle from the tree in the yard.